Greetings, my loves. My name is Jasmine Brantley of Inspire Me Jazzy, as well as the fabulous ladies of Inspire Me Jazzy. And I would like to welcome you to our Connect and Conquer Bible study call that we have hosted every single Monday for the duration of February. Now, for those of you that may not be aware, we are collectively studying a reading plan this month entitled My Words carry weight. And we are currently on day 28 of that reading plan, which is entitled Speaking a Word in Season. However, instead of actually dealing with that passage of scripture, I plan to actually operate in that as I share with you what God has pressed upon my heart. However, before we get there, being that God has granted us the privilege of connecting with one another on the last day of the month, although I will probably speak to this publicly via social media, I want to take a moment to share with you all who are present the vision for the month of March as we prepare to shift things a bit. So as many of you all know, I took a step back from public ministry for the month of January while my team stepped up to the plate. However, well before my sabbatical, it had already been made clear to me where we, where we would be going upon my return. So the my words carry weight challenge did not come from a word spoken during that season. However, during my sabbatical, I definitely received clarity and confirmation concerning what was next. And as a result of that, I, I believe I, I have a pretty good idea of the direction we will be going for months to come. With that being said, I wanted to be clear that the month of February was simply preparation for where God has for us to go during the month of March. Purifying our speech was necessary. Changing our language was necessary. Praying and fasting was necessary. Because hear me clearly, we are about to shake some things up, honey. Listen to me. It's time for us to use our words wisely. It's time for us to use our words intentionally. It's time for us to speak both life and death to some things, to bind and loose some things, to rebuke and silence some things. It's time for us to walk in our God given authority. It's time for us to speak truth boldly and unapologetically as we continue to allow Him to be the master of our mouths. So for the month of March, we will be dealing with the topic of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is the terminology used to describe the conflict that Christians face against the devil and demonic spirits. Dr. Tony Evans defines it as the cosmic conflict waged in the invisible spiritual realm, but simultaneously fleshed out in the visible physical realm which our enemy, the devil, uses when he seeks to defeat us. So hear me clearly. If for any reason there is any confusion or any uncertainty, I want it to be absolutely clear in this moment that I believe that the enemy is real, that demons are real, that witchcraft is real, that divination is real, and none of it is without power. Now, is it more powerful than the God that we serve? Absolutely not. Yet I believe we are in a dangerous place as a church when we find ourselves ignorant and unequipped concerning its realities. The church, the body of Christ, we have failed in this area for far too long. We have either given the enemy way too much power or we stripped him of all power. We have completely ignored the existence of unclean demonic spirits or we allow fear to paralyze us in the face of them. What happens when the believer finds themselves standing in the face of a witch or a warlock? What happens when the believer is standing in the face of a person not realizing that we are actually looking at a demonic spirit right in the eye? Do we know what we are looking at? Do we know what we are dealing with? Do we know what spirits, what behaviors, what practices are prevalent and present in our culture, in our nation, in our homes, in our bloodlines, even within our churches? Are we in, equipped to engage in warfare 
or do we run scared? Are we knowledgeable or do we avoid certain topics when they arise because they simply make us uncomfortable? Hear me, for the month of March, we are going there boldly and unapologetically. Now I realize that historically, this isn't something that this particular ministry has been silent about, but I am absolutely certain that the time has arrived yet again for us to revisit this topic and speak to its realities publicly. So we will be releasing a Bible reading plan entitled I Declare War that we will begin on Monday, February the 7th, 2022. And this plan will be a revised, updated combination of two plans that we have released historically. The first released in September of 27 entitled I Declare War and the second released in November of 2020 entitled What Does God Require of Me? Part three, a biblical study on witchcraft, divination and unclean spirits. So hear me, things are about to shift a, a bit around here and I encourage you all to be prepared for it. I encourage you, I need you to hear me clearly. I encourage you to show up, to tune in, to stay connected because the plan is to consistently have content before you and discussions concerning this all month long. I want to encourage you not to shy away from this, but to really take the time to get educated in this. I want you to be willing to unlearn some things that you may have held on to your entire lives. I want you to be willing to respond to the spirit of God when you hear him, feel him, see him. I want you to choose to avoid, hear me, defending what you may not have the full story concerned. I want you to choose not to be offended, but to be open to truth. I want you to make a commitment to really sit with the information that is going to be presented to you, to communicate with God concerning it, and to respond righteously to it. Now, hear me. I don't want to, I don't want to overlook the fact that this topic can be scary. I realize that many things are taught concerning deliverance and spiritual warfare that are not biblical. And many things scripturally are taken out of context and or communicated in a way that causes believers to stray away. But hear me clearly. I believe this is exactly why we have to deal with this. So that truth can be communicated in a way that it is understood and received, which creates the opportunity for us to apply and or operate according to what we now know. So stay tuned for more details, for more content, for the link to register to the plan, for the plan, and for more fellowship opportunities during the month of March, all right? Well, before we go any further, I never know who is going to grace us with their presence. So if you are new here on behalf of myself and my amazing dream team, we simply say welcome home. Listen, we are so glad to have you. And I simply don't believe that you are here by mistake. We have absolutely prayed for you. So your mere presence here is the evidence of the faithfulness of God. So please make yourselves right at home and feel free to jump right into the action because you are now officially in a safe space, a holy space that is filled with a different breed of believers. I do not at all take your presence here lightly. Whether you are a new face or a returning face, we are glad to have you simple as that you are home. Now, I've shared this multiple times before as recently as our last call, but I need you all to hear me. It is never my desire to gather with other believers out of routine. And likewise, it is also never my desire to gather with other believers because it is the religious, godly, habitual, spiritual thing to do. Hear me. If there was ever any doubt, I needed to be clear that I am here because I need this. I need to connect with the people of God and experience the presence and power of God all at the exact same time. I need an atmosphere where people from various walks of life can show up without a mask, in pain, in sin, in the midst of the most trying and challenging times of their lives, yet still be seen, heard, felt, embraced, encouraged, and loved. 
I need an atmosphere where people can be told the truth in love and with grace, where we can all receive correction and be brought to a place of repentance, realizing that we have all fallen short of the glory of the most high God. I need an atmosphere where people can experience real change, <clears throat> not just emotional experiences. Okay. I need an atmosphere where growth is my portion because diving deep into the word of God is simply what they do. I need an atmosphere where the spiritual gifts of others are not minimized, stifled, or silenced. I need an atmosphere where leaders, husbands, wives, parents, business owners, people in general, despite their position and or placement, are able to be real and authentic about where they are without being judged or criticized horribly. Hear me, I need an atmosphere where people can feel the wind of God, see the power of God, hear the voice of God, experience the love of God like they never have before. So with all of that being said, I, I know that many of you all love me. I know that many of you all love members of our team and, and we love you right back. But I wanna make this clear. I don't want you to show up to these calls for me or for any one of our leaders. I want you to show up for him. But my desire is for each of you to have a true hunger for God, a true desire to hear from God, a real expectation in your heart to receive from God himself, to see God move as only he can, because I just believe that God moves in indescribable ways when you have believers gathered together in his name that are hungry and desperate, but nothing but more of him. So if by chance you join this call for any other reason than a genuine desire to hear from and experience God, then I pray that what brought you here is not the reason that you return. I pray that you have an encounter with God on this call that leaves you desiring more of him so much so that it affects your daily lives. And Monday nights, simply become icing on the cake. And with that being said, I thank each and every one of you for your presence physically. But now I humbly ask that you also be present spiritually. What do you mean? Listen, you can be present and not be present. You can be here, right? But mentally and emotionally, you can be somewhere completely different. You can be so distracted, so discombobulated, so frustrated, so discouraged that you can struggle to really be present in the present. So it is in this moment that I ask that you do your part to eliminate as many distractions as you possibly can so that you can not only be present, tuned in to hear what the spirit of the Lord has to say to you, but also so that you can be available if the Lord desires to use you to encourage someone else. Realizing that this call, this ministry has never been and will never be about me. So my prayer is consistently that he speaks to and through whoever he sees fit. And that includes you. So as we prepare to pause, I humbly request that you do within this time what you know you need to do in this moment. Whether that's taking a few deep breaths, sitting up in your bed, closing your door, going into another room, saying a quick prayer, turning your camera on to remain accountable and present. Whatever that looks like for you, I ask that you do that in this moment. And with this request in mind, we are going to pause for the cause to get our hearts and minds in position to receive and or show up accordingly. So if you would please join me for a brief, moment of silence.
Father God, we come before you right now, Lord, and we just take this moment, God, to honor you and give you the glory, Father God, that you deserve, Lord. As we prepare this space for you, God, we welcome you in, Father God, to have your way in this call, God, that you do, Father God, what only you can do, Father God, that you speak to the hearts of your children, God, who are here awaiting, Father God. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us came with a, a heart of expectancy, Father God, with a standard, Father God, set in their hearts, Father God, that you, knowing, Father God, that you will blow us away, Father God, as you have each and every week, Lord, that we have met, God. We thank you, Lord, for the new faces and the returning faces that have put trust into this ministry, God. I pray, Lord, that whatever they bring to the throne, whether it be verbally, Father God, or just personally, Lord, that you answer them, Father God, that you show them, Father God, the path that you have for them, God, that you bring healing where it is needed, Father God, that you bring separation where it is needed, God, um, that you bring, Father God, clarity of the mind, Father God, we rebuke distractions, Father God, and poor connections, Lord, so that all of us, Father God, can hear the word clearly, God. We pray, Lord, that you use Jasmine, Father God, is your mouthpiece, God, but that we don't come here for her, God, but we come here for you, God, so we rebuke, Father God, um, any spirit, Father God, trying to rise up against the word that is going to be coming forth, God, and we just ask father god that you cover us with your peace and protection in this moment in your son's precious name we pray amen for those of you that desire to join me for the purposes of today's discussion i encourage you to turn to the book of matthew chapter 26 beginning at verse 69 again that is the book of matthew chapter 26 beginning at verse 69. Thank you, Analia. And for those of you who have joined us on the reading plan this month, this lesson will coincide with day 25's assigned reading. And it is entitled, Your Speech Betrays You. So again, that's the book of Matthew chapter six, beginning at verse 69. But of course, before we do directly with the given passage of scripture, for more reasons than one, it's extremely important to me that we are all aware of the events that bring us to this space and place. Now, we are in the New Testament and we are in the gospels, which places an intentional focus on the good news, Jesus Christ. So at this point in time in scripture, Jesus is on the scene. And in this specific passage, we are actually going to deal with one of his disciples in particular, a gentleman by the name, of Peter. Now, in order to ensure that we really know the character and the heart of the person we are dealing with, if you don't mind, I would like to take you all on a bit of a journey as we take a closer look at this particular individual and the relationship that he has with Jesus. Now, it seems that Peter was initially introduced to Jesus through his brother, Andrew. Andrew was initially a disciple of John, but when he heard Jesus speak, he began to follow Jesus. He spends some time with Jesus that particular day, and after doing so, he finds his brother, who is also known as Simon, and tells him that they have found the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, the Anointed One. And Andrew brings Peter to Jesus, who then looks at him and says to him, you are Simon the son of Jonah, but you shall be called Cephas, which means stone. Hear me, so from the very first time that they meet, Jesus uses his words to tell Peter who he is and what he was going to be identified as. Now, the next time that we see Peter, he's at work with his brother, being that they were both fishermen. They had left their boats and were washing their nets, yet Jesus is found teaching a large crowd, standing by the lake, and decides to get into Simon Peter's boat. He makes a request of Simon to put out a little from the shore, and he sits down and teaches the multitude from this boat. Now, after he finishes speaking to the crowd, Jesus turns his attention to Peter, and he instructs him to launch out into the deep and let his net down for a catch. Peter responds, and in so many words, he is like, listen, <laughs> master, teacher, sir, <laughs> hear me. This is what we do, right? And, and we have toiled, we have grown weary, we are exhausted from all the effort we have put into this already. 
They, they say we have worked extremely hard. We have worked all night long. We have labored consistently and we have caught nothing. Okay, let's make it personal and relevant. Listen, I do this. I'm a hustler. I know how to grind. I stay in my bag. I have literally done everything that I know how to do. I have put my all into this. I have worked hard for this. I have put blood, sweat, and tears into this. I'm exhausted from this. And at this point, it seems like it was all for nothing. Hear me, I, I keep coming up empty. I still have nothing to show for the work that I have done. There is still no physical evidence of what I have done. I still possess nothing of value. I have nothing to take back to my family. I have nothing to give to anyone else. I'm still in the same position that I was before I even came here. Listen to me. It's not that I'm lazy. It's not that I'm not willing to work. I do this. But for some reason, I'm not catching a thing. But the text says, Peter hit, hit Jesus with a nonetheless. <laughs> nevertheless means in spite of that, even so, having said that, regardless of that, be that as it may, at your word, I will let down the next. Can I ask you a question? Is his word enough motivation for you to hit him with a nevertheless? I'm tired, God, but nevertheless. I keep coming up short, God, but nevertheless. I, I've been doing this all night long, God, but nevertheless. I don't think I have it in me to give, God, but nevertheless. I'm not sure if this is even going to work, God, if this time will be different, God, if we will even get a different outcome, God, but never the less. I could be opening myself up to feel defeated and discouraged all over again, God, but never the less. Hear me. Is a word from the master enough for you to give Jesus a nevertheless as you follow his instruction, launch into the deep and let down your net for a catch? Listen to me. Even after you have washed your net, <laughs> Even after you have given up on a thing, <laughs> even after you have washed your hands with that thing, even after you have finally cleaned off the debris from that thing, even though you didn't plan to revisit this thing any time soon, are you willing to risk failure again at the instruction of the master? Are you willing to launch out, to set sail, to move from here to there so that you can respond righteously to the instruction of your master? Back to the text. As a result of Peter's obedience to the instruction of Jesus, they catch a great number of fish. So much so that they don't even have the capacity to carry it without their nets breaking. Hear me, the blessing is pressed down, shaken together and running over. So much so that they don't even have enough room to receive it. They have to call their partners, their companions, their colleagues in the other boat to come and help them carry the blessing. The blessing fills both boats and it's so heavy that they begin to sink. And that will preach all by itself, but I'm going to keep it moving. The text says when Simon Peter saw it, he falls down at the knees of Jesus and declares his unworthiness before him declares his sinful nature, declares in so many words that he isn't worthy enough to be in the presence of Jesus. Hear me, all are astonished at the catch of the fish, but Peter was the only one to fall to the knees of Jesus and declare his unworthiness before him. Jesus says to him in response, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch me. So in other words, I'm not changing what you do, Peter. I'm just changing your focus when you do it. They, they bring their boats to land and hear me, what they had worked so hard for, what they had put their all into on their own and received nothing, they had now received with ease simply because Jesus was in their boats and Peter hit him with a nevertheless. But don't miss this part. The text tells us 
that after they bought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Did y'all hear what I just said? Listen, they forsook all, they walked away from it. They gave it up. After all of that, they, they gave it up. Do you know how much money they were walking away from? Do you know how valuable those two boats full of fish were? Do you, do you know what they could have done with that? What they could have done for their households, for their reputation? Do you realize how hard they had worked for that? And it was finally their moment. They finally had it in their possession. And the text says they forsook all and followed him. So my question becomes, what are you willing to give up? to follow Jesus. Hear me clearly. As we end this month and transition into next month, I truly believe that this is a question that we all need to seriously consider. What is so valuable to you that you would hesitate to give it up in order to follow Jesus? What means so much to you that you would consider getting out of alignment with Jesus in order to fulfill that desire? Rid yourself of that emotion, prove that point, maintain that behavior, that story, that relationship, that reality. Are you ready to follow Jesus for real? Even if that means forsaking what you have been working so hard to achieve. Are you ready to be a disciple of Jesus? Even if that means walking away from some things giving up something, saying no to some things, disconnecting from some people, disengaging in some activities. Are you about this life for real? Or is your relationship with Jesus restricted and dependent upon your comfort and convenience? They forsook it all and followed Jesus. Let's keep it moving. Peter experiences Jesus in so many ways. He literally stands over Peter's, Jesus literally stands over P Peter's mother-in-law, rebukes her fever, and it leaves her. He is recorded being the person of choice that Jesus uses to demonstrate the power of forgiveness to a sinful woman. We find him in Matthew chapter 16, having a conversation with Jesus. Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he asks them, well, who do men say that I am? They answer him and they say, well, some, some say you are John the Baptist and some say you are the prophet Elijah and some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up in this moment and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answers and says, blessed are you. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So hear me, in this moment, Jesus uses his words to declare that Peter hears from heaven. So much so that the words that Peter had just spoken were actually going to serve as the rock that Jesus was going to build his church on. He declares in this moment that Peter has keys to the kingdom of heaven to, to bind and to loose on earth according to what had already been binded and loosed in heaven. So what we actually read in Matthew 16 verses 14 through 20 is an example of kingdom speech. But wait, because if we keep reading, verse 21 tells us that Jesus then begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem that he was going to have to suffer, that he was going to experience many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, the religious leaders, even to the point of death. Now, as I sat with this, what I realized is that what the text is actually showing us is that Jesus experienced church hurt on a level that was unbelievable. He was lied on by the body of Christ. He was rejected by the body of Christ. He was unappreciated, disrespected, spit upon by the body of Christ. The one who should have embraced him sought to destroy him. The one who should have loved him spoke against him. Jesus died for the world, but he was put on the cross by the church. 
And I know this isn't what we are dealing with this month, but when God reminded me of this today, it really ministered to me because a lot of us are struggling today because of the church. A lot of us have been rejected by the body of Christ. A lot of us have felt unappreciated, disrespected, spit upon, abused by the body of Christ. A lot of us feel like the place that should have loved us and supported us is the place that spoke against us. A lot of us feel like the place that should have embraced us is the place that sought to destroy us. A lot of us feel like we are dying for the sake of unbelievers but we are being placed on the cross by the church. And it was in this moment that I realized that Jesus had to do and continues to do what many of us are struggling to do. And that is to forgive the body. I realize that sometimes we have to lay on the cross that they put us on and seek forgiveness on their behalf because they simply do not know what they are doing. We have to pray for the same heart, the same compassion, the same strength that Jesus had so that we can forgive the church, forgive the body of Christ for failing to see us through the eyes of God, for failing to treat us as he so desires and for failing to love us as he loves his church. Back to the text. Jesus speaks to this reality. He speaks this reality to his disciples. He speaks to the death that he would experience at the hands of the religious leaders, but not without declaring that he would indeed be raised again on the third day. Now, watch this. Peter hears this truth, this declaration, this reality, and he pulls Jesus to the side and begins to rebuke Jesus. You rebuking Jesus? <laughs> like, really? Okay. Keeping in mind that to rebuke is to express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behavior or actions. So Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Now let's keep it in mind that what Jesus was speaking was literally the reason that Jesus was born. This had to happen. He had to experience death so that we could have life. This was his purpose. This was his assignment. This was why God sent him. So the, re the words that Jesus spoke were in alignment with his father. But let's be clear, they, they weren't pretty words. They weren't words that were easy to hear, especially from someone you love and care about. Let's make it relevant. Because from the outside looking in, it could sound like Jesus was speaking negative when Jesus was simply stating facts. From the outside looking in, it could look like Jesus was speaking death when Jesus was speaking purposefully, intentionally, and prophetically. So if your ears are not tuned into heaven as you hear the speech of others, you could be rebuking purpose in the lives of those that you love the most. Hear me, I know it's coming from a good place. I, I know you love me. I, I know you care about me. I know you hear from heaven because you have revealed truth that could not have been known by anyone but my father. But right here and right now, I need you to care more about being in alignment with my father concerning me than you do about protecting me. What happens when the same voice that spoke your father's heart concerning you is the same person that is coming up the purpose up coming up against the purpose that he has for you. What happens when the same person that used to see you correctly is the same person who pulls you to the side and rebukes what God desires to accomplish through you? What happens when the same person that you spoke blessing over becomes the same person that has become a stumbling block towards carrying out your assignment? What happens when the same voice that hears from heaven is now speaking words that are coming straight from the enemy? Hear me, what happens when their protection of you and their love for you causes them to speak things 
that are in direct contradiction to the reason you were created? What if losing what I bring to their life takes priority over what God desires to do through my life? What if I'm now receiving disapproval and criticism concerning the very thing that is going to serve as a source of life for many? Are we able to identify and recognize when the source of the speech has changed, even if it's coming from the exact same person? Are we able to speak to the same individual and confirm that yes, you hear from heaven, while also readily recognizing when they are not being mindful of the things of God, therefore speaking to the spirit that is arising within them and telling it directly to get thee behind you, Satan. Back to the text. This gentleman, Peter, continues to have amazing experiences and fruitful, interesting conversations with Jesus. Peter has the experience of walking on water towards Jesus. He seems to deal with Peter heavily concerning forgiveness. Peter is also a part of what I like to call Jesus's inner circle. Yes, Jesus has the 12, right? 12 disciples that have all received from him, walked with him, been empowered by him. But at the same time, he has three that he seems to share things with that he doesn't share with the others. Miracles that they are allowed in the room for when the others are dismissed and not present. Things that he allows them to experience that the others do not. Things that he trusts them to refuse to speak to until they have been released to. And Peter is amongst the three. It's clear that, that Peter loves Jesus. Peter rocks with Jesus. As it came time for Jesus to be betrayed, we are then let in on a different conversation that they have. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples, all of you will be made to stumble this night because of me. Peter says, listen, I don't know about them. <laughs> I'm not going to speak for them, but even if they all stumble, even if they miss the mark, even if they fail you, Jesus, I won't. You hear me? I, I'm rocking with you. I got you, Jesus, hands down. You may not be able to count on all 11, but I can guarantee that you at least got one, right? And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but this is the essence of what Peter says in this moment. But Jesus says to him, in this moment, Peter, I hear you. But before this night ends, <laughs> before the rooster crows, you are going to deny me. Disassociate yourself with me. Fail to affirm your relationship with me. Three times. Peter says, oh, nah, <laughs> negative, not happening. Even if I have to die with you, I'm riding with you. I will not deny you, Jesus. Well, the story continues. Jesus goes to the garden to spend time with his father as he prepares to carry out his assignment. Jesus is in pain. He is hurting. He is struggling. He shares his truth, his reality with his crew. And he tells them to stay in position and be on guard, be alert, be cautious, pay attention. Yet his disciples fall asleep on the job. They fail to be in position. They leave Jesus open, vulnerable, uncovered. Jesus returns and says to Peter, what, you, could, you, could you not watch? With me for one hour? <laughs> Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He leaves a second time. He spends time with his father as he prepares for the most critical time in his ministry, yet returns to his disciples sleeping. Yet again, as the text says, that their eyes were heavy. He leaves again the third time and returns to his disciples, yet again, failing to watch and pray as he had asked. And he says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Hear me clearly. 
Sometimes we fail to speak to how people have failed us. How people have failed to show up for us during key and critical times in our lives. But sometimes the moment requires that you speak to it versus remaining silent concerning it. Listen to me. People do not know what you do not make clear. People cannot be held accountable for what you haven't spoken in your heart concerning. Whether they change or not is on them, but it should not be because you failed to speak to a thing. Hear me, even if you have to address it more than once, as Jesus did, let your expectations be clear. But likewise, hear me, with the correct posture, <laughs> the correct heart posture, with grace seasoned, with salt, with the proper motives, let the failures of those that you entrusted also be clearly communicated. Expectations and accountability, clarity and honesty, they are all considered kingdom speech. So back to the text, Jesus is betrayed and arrested. And Peter is so upset with the fact that they laid hands on Jesus <laughs> that he cuts the ear off of one of the men. Jesus has to get him back in line and heal the man's ear. But before it's all said and done, the text tells us that all of the disciples, forsook him and fled. But being that the focus is on Peter specifically, the text tells us that as they led Jesus away, Peter followed him from a distance to the courtyard. And he went and sat with the servants. So he keeps space between him and Jesus. There is a certain amount of separation, a certain amount of disassociation that Peter begins to operate and he, he's close, but he isn't close, right? He's around, but he isn't near. He's in the same vicinity as Jesus, but he isn't close enough for anybody to know that he is with Jesus. Hear me, and as I dealt with this, I heard this is how many of my people are with me today. Listen to me, some of us are denying Jesus with our actions every single day. We are following him at a distance. We are around Jesus, but we won't get too close to him. We are in the same vicinity as him, but we won't get close enough to let anybody know that we are with him. We have disassociated ourselves in action without ever saying a word. Peter sits among servants attempts to fit in amongst a different community, attempts to belong where he doesn't while watching Jesus from afar. You know, similar to how some of us do today, sitting amongst servants, <laughs> sitting amongst communities where we simply don't belong, maintaining connections that don't make sense while we watch Jesus from afar. Peter is waiting, watching from a distance to see the end, to see the outcome, to see the result, to see what was going to happen to Jesus. He gets to witness kingdom speech in action. Jesus remains silent concerning certain accusations, but he speaks up when he needs to make it known who he is. They begin to speak against him, speak death concerning him, spit up on him, beat him and strike him with their hands. And this brings us to the actual assigned reading. And now that I am here, I am almost done. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 in the New King James Version reads, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, with a promise, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them for your speech betrays you. Let's pause. Speech in the Greek speaks to a person's mode of speech, their dialect, their pronunciation. 
Speech in the English is defined as a person's style of speaking, a person's ability to express thoughts and feelings through words. So it seems that in this moment, Peter was either being accused of speaking the same language of Jesus or using the same style of speech as Jesus. And I'm not taking anything away from the reality of this moment, from the truth of this moment. But what I could not help but to consider was the fact that Peter was intentionally denying association with who he actually sounded like. So his mouth was saying one thing, but his manner of speaking was saying another. His manner communicated relationship with Jesus, even though his words denied Jesus. And this made me wonder if this could be true for any of us. Have we spent enough time following Jesus that we couldn't deny him even if we tried? Have we spent so much time talking with Jesus and walking with Jesus and imitating Jesus that disassociating, disassociating ourselves from him would be extremely hard to do? Does our manner of living, speaking, being, communicate relationship with Jesus? Or would our speech fail to betray us because we sound more like the servants than we do the king? Verse 74, then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Let me deal with this briefly, and I'm done. If it hasn't been made clear, this month was more than about profanity. But I don't want to close this month out without dealing with it directly. Hear me. Peter had denied Jesus twice at this point, and it escalated each time. The first time his denial was simply stated. The second time the denial included an oath. And this time the denial included cursing and swearing. To curse is to use offensive words or phrases to express anger or annoyance. Synonyms include swear words, profanity, cuss words. Profanity is defined as blasphemous or obscene language. It is ir irreligious or irreverent behavior. To swear speaks to using offensive language typically to express anger. So with that being said, cursing, profanity, swearing seems to be directly connected to anger and or annoyance. But likewise, based on Peter's usage of profanity, it also seems to be used to emphasize, to stress something, to provide words with a greater sense of weight. So hear me clearly. If you struggle with the usage of profanity, I want you to consider seriously dealing with the why and be honest with you. Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you annoyed? Are there some things inside of you that need to be dealt with so that you can stop speaking in a way that is beneath you? Likewise, if that's not your story, if you aren't angry, if you aren't struggling with unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, things of that nature, yet you still find yourself speaking this type of language, then maybe you might want to sit with yourself and seriously consider where you feel like your words fail to carry the weight that they should. Because somewhere along the way, you begin to feel the need to use language, to emphasize, and give a greater weight to what you speak, not realizing that speech that is surrendered to the king needs no additional emphasis. And on that note, may God bless and keep each and every one of you. We have, uh, we are actually going to transition to what I believe is the most vital part of this call. Um, so as I go forth and share with you guys publicly what I am talking about, I'm going to ask our leaders to pray during this space and time as we go forth and discuss um, this portion of the call. Now, um, if I'm honest, 
nothing that takes place on these calls matter. If all we do is help you to live a better life on earth and you still wind up going to hell, eternally separated from God when you leave here. And I literally cannot fathom knowing that someone may have connected with us week after week or even one time and may have been positive, positively impacted by what takes place here, yet they have never been saved, never actually received and confessed Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. Hear me. We literally cannot verbally communicate how much we care for each and every one of you without demonstrating that care in the way that it matters the most. So a couple of things I, I want to make clear in this moment. Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hear me, the mouth, the tongue is so valuable that it is used for you to receive salvation. Scripture says that it is with the heart that one believes unto righteousness, but it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. It continues to say that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not be put to shame, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what I am actually saying to you in this moment is that you don't have to be perfect to be saved. You don't have to get your life together in order to come to Jesus. You don't have to live right even after you are saved. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And salvation, heaven, eternal life with Christ shall be your portion. Now, likewise, this is also an opportunity for rededication. And I want to be clear that rededication is not as simple as I sinned. I messed up. I need to rededicate my life to Christ. If that's the case, honey, we would all need to do that day after day after day. And in a sense, we do. But in this moment, rededication speaks to someone who has once accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they have since drifted away. They have rejected him. They have rebelled against him. They have gotten so angry with him that they walked away from the faith. Well, this time could also be the fact those that have been serving God, but not God alone. You have failed to truly make him your Lord and Savior by dabbling in things such as witchcraft, horoscopes, astrology, idolatry, fortune telling, tarot card reading, burning sage, other religions and or cultural beliefs. So this could be someone who has been acknowledging God in their own way, but has also been allowing and inviting other guys to protect them, sustain them, lead them, et cetera. So this is a moment of public declaration that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is it for you. Simple as that. So with that being said, I do not want to assume that everybody present is saved. And I do not want to miss the opportunity that we have been given to offer salvation and or rededication to those that desire it. However, I do want to be clear that if you don't genuinely believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he died, was buried and rose again with all power for your sins, then repeating this prayer will not get you into heaven. This isn't just about repetition. This is about a heart that genuinely desires to make a choice and do this thing called life his way. So what we are going to do in this moment is collectively say a prayer of salvation. It has been posted in the chat, both in English and in Spanish. I will lead in prayer and I humbly request that you all repeat after me. I ask that you take your phones off of mute in this moment so that if someone is not saved but desires to be saved, that they get to make this decision and recite this confession amongst community. So if you would, Again, please take your phones off of mute and repeat after me. God, without you, I am nothing. God, without you, I am nothing. Without you, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Without you, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Your son, Jesus. To die on the cross for my sins. To die on the cross for my sins. Thank you for allowing Jesus to be raised from the dead. 
Thank you for allowing Jesus to raise us from the dead. With all power in his hand. With all power in his hand. That in this moment I confess Jesus Christ. God, in this moment I confess Jesus Christ. To not only be your son. To not only be your son. But to also be my Lord and Savior. But to also, also, also be my Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. As a result of this confession, as a result of this confession, I receive the divinity. I receive the divinity. And I believe that I am now the righteousness of God. I believe that I am now the righteousness of God. Through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Sanctify me by your truth. Sanctify me by your truth. Saturate me with your love. Saturate me with your love. Have your way in my life. Have your way in my life. In this day forward. From this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.